When you're brought onto something that that's pre-established, like the Meet the Parents movies or, or Zoolander, um, where there are so many uh, cooks in the kitchen, or at least other people involved, how do you typically work? Do you do you go off and work by yourself and then bring something back, or are you are you thrown into working with people right from the start? I work by myself generally. I mean, it usually in those kind of situations, there's like one leader. Mm -hmm. You know, I or I always think the times where I've gotten into trouble on movies is where there's not a clear voice, a okay. clear leader. Mm -hmm. But on those movies, you know, there was somebody in charge of the ship, and I usually talk with them about the story and what the problems are, what I think we should do with it, and then I go off and write by myself. I never have written with a partner, okay. although I was thinking this might be much more fun <laughs> if I had a guy sitting next to me. Right. Uh, but you know, I just, I write alone, basically. Mm -hmm. So then I write and I, you know, hand it over to the director or the star or whatever it is, or we all sit in a room together and go over the pages and riff and talk, and then I go off alone and, and do more writing. And is that a big concern if you were brought, when you're brought rewrite assignments, if there is no director or vision behind the process, does that go into your decision making in terms of will I accept this or not as a project? Yeah. I mean, I don't do very many of them. Right. Uh, but I, you know, maybe one a year, at, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's always really important to me, like, who's, whose movie is it? Who's the director or is it the star's movie? You know, what? Yeah, because I think when there's no clear vision, then you get these movies that are like an amalgam of tones and different styles. Sure. And, and I feel like the things that I'm good at really won't be serviced by the movie. And when you're working on uh, Deadline, or you mentioned there was a start date for Meet the Parents. Yeah. And I don't know if Zoolander was the same situation, but do you feel a pressure when you're working within a specific time uh, frame and how do you deal with that? There, yeah, there's definitely pressure. I mean, I think for some reason, Everybody's good at different things. Right. I, for some reason, I've been good at blocking out the insanity of like, there's a $70 million movie that's starting in three weeks, and if you don't fix this script, we're all gonna get fired <laughs> and probably you know, lose right. our houses and stuff like that. I don't know, I just like block it out and try to write. Right. And sometimes, like I just did one, you know, maybe my rewrite for the year, uh, where you know, there's a big movie going and I worked on it for about five weeks, and it, it, you know, when you're writing, you have to write that fast, there's really no time to freak out. You and just are like, I gotta deliver 10, 15 pages a day. Right. When I write my own scripts, I feel a t like, you know, that I'm gonna direct, I feel right. a ton of pressure and self-doubt, and oh my God, this is never gonna be as good as. Oh, so that's interesting, do you feel more pressure on your own stuff? Absolutely. Than the, than kind of the rewrite jobs and stuff? Yeah, I mean, the rewrite jobs, I, I never take one that I feel like I can't, do a great job, and I, I want to see it through to right. the end. I usually come on towards the end and want to do it, you know, either through shooting right. or up to shooting because I and I get passionate about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I get emotionally involved, right? It, it, because you have to to do good writing. Mm -hmm. But um, but in my own scripts that I'm starting from scratch and I know I'm going to direct, there's a totally different pressure, mm -hmm. and those take me longer. Oftentimes, I wish I could bring the level of urgency that I bring to the rewrites right. to my own work. And it's great, you, you've, worked, you've collaborated with much of, many of the same players when you have been brought on to, to rewrite something or collaborate with people. Yeah. And is that gratifying or is that, does that make it easier that you, you're familiar with all the, the, the people that you're working yeah, with? Yeah, there's a comfort. Yeah. I mean, you just, there's a trust and a comfort when you've worked with these people before. And you know, I've tried to work with people that I think really want the movies to be great. I mean, it's, they don't always turn out great, they turn out, you know, it, who knows, it's so hard to make good movies. Right. But I, we all know that we're trying, none of us are making a movie just for a release date, right. you know, and oh, it'll open to 30 million. It's like we're all trying really hard to make really, really good movies. Right. Whether we fail or succeed is not the point, it's like right. we're trying. And do you have a different approach for writing a self-contained kind of comic set piece scene as opposed to your approach to the, writing the script at, at large or in general, do they ever, are they ever, is it ever a separate process to the set piece versus the overall picture? It, it's funny, I, people, that's like a term, I was just talking about this with somebody okay. yesterday, because they were like, what's a set piece? I was like, I don't really know, but I know that studio executives keep wanting me to bring them to movies. <laughs> right. Um, I was like, is it a piece that takes place in a set, but doesn't right. everything take place in a set? I don't really know. Right. How do the studio execs phrase that in notes you get back in terms of they go, we need more set pieces in the second <laughs> act. We love right. this set piece. You know, like I had pitched 
Along what became, it was untitled forever. That's mm-hmm. why I say what became Along Came Polly. And I, I pitched you know, to the heads of Universal what I thought was this really sort of layered, romantic movie you know, about, I mean, funny, a total comedy, right. but I, you know, about a guy who's planned his life out and the rug gets pulled out from under him and don't we all plan things and it doesn't work out. Sure. And I pitched this whole thing and then I walk out and I remember the president of the studio going, that scene in the bathroom is a great set piece. <laughs> I was like, that's what it comes down to. You know, right. that's like, those are the memorable kind of things. But I never thought of it, to me it was just a scene that the character right. goes on. So I don't think, my writing, I never think like, here's a set piece in a bathroom. Here's a set piece, you know, on a basketball court with Ben and Phil Hoffman, you know, and he right. rubs up against a sweaty guy. I always think of it like, what would this character do? Okay, it's like in Along Came Polly, it's Ben Stiller plays basketball, because that's, I play basketball, so I think, you know, I just put myself in those situations, and, and I just think of the character, his nightmare would be to have to guard a really sweaty guy right. who, you know, rubs up against him in a, in a grotesque way. So it's never like this is going to be a big comic set piece, it's just like right. this could serve as the story. Did you also have a bad Indian food experience in your, in your history? Uh, not as bad as what <laughs> Stiller goes through, right. but I, you know, I think I'm like both characters in that movie. I love ethnic food, but... Uh, I'm a Jew with stomach issues, <laughs> right. so. In, in the process of your outlining or in the process of you coming up with your story, even, even if you, when you pitch it verbally, uh, the, the, the comic scenes come out, organically come out of just where the story's gonna go. Where, and it sounds like you use character as a base for where things can get funny. Or, yeah, to me, character is everything. That's where I start. You know, I have ideas for the characters, and I have the basic germ of of an idea for the movie, but then I start to really think about the characters. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they dictate where the story goes. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's all that, you know, and it's, I picture what would the character hate? What would he right. like, you know, he or she, whatever it is. And it, even a movie like Zoolander, which is jokes, a lot of jokes, but to me, I thought of them as being in, they're very serious about their lives. Right. And I thought of them like the, you know, the friendship between Derek and Hansel, <laughs> Like, I, to me, I treated like a real friendship. I can't even hear the word Hansel without replaying the entire film in my head okay. and start cracking up. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, you know. I saw the original BH1 short. Yeah. Is that a challenge, kind of, a, and you, you, you have experienced the short film making and, and expanding things, but was that a challenge to expand that to a feature-length story yes. that could hold up and yeah. not, not be just a series of sketches? Yeah, because we didn't want it. There's some very good movies from Saturday Night Live sketches, but to be candid, some pretty bad movies because... I think it, there's three. I think there's three good movies. Okay, there's a few, yeah, yeah. But you know, because it's hard. It's like feature films and sketch comedy are different, right. sure. you know? And it was, so yeah, definitely it was a challenge and how do we, this ridiculous character, Derek Zoolander and Hansel and mm-hmm. you know, Mugatu, the Will Ferrell character, like how do you sustain that for an hour and a half right. and have, like, you know, we really talked a lot, more than I think anybody would suspect of What's Derek's emotional journey? Right. And what's Hansel, you know, what's his journey? And I think, to me, like I think where Ben did a great job directing it is like the movie, I, I love the movie, but I think it takes off when Derek and Hansel start to really team up together. It's really a love story between the two guys That's in what a way. It is. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and we worked a lot on the story and what could the story be and what, we don't want it to, to just be a series of set pieces like we're talking about right. or jokes, because then it's gonna be, whatever. It's mm-hmm. not, then it's going to be a disposable movie that right. maybe, you know, some people like and some don't. I think it wasn't a huge hit when it came out, but I think part of the reason that, right. like for my life, that's one of the movies people bring up right. to me the most. I know for Stiller's life, you know, who's obviously out there as Ben Stiller, that's right. a big one for, in his right. canon. But I think, you know, it, it's lived on because the characters are sort of real in their own right. way. Does it help you when you know you're writing for specific actors, when you know, you know who's going to be in a movie? I felt for you, I would, my last months at DreamWorks, I was at that last table reading of Meet the Fockers. Right. And you know, they, they called in John Hamburg, all through the process, I was like, wait till we get to John Hamburg, John Hamburg will give us a shooting script. And even just looking around that table, you're surrounded by like mega, I mean, mega talent, oh, yeah. like Barbara Streisand sitting there, Dustin Hoffman, Robert De Niro, Blythe Danner, like everyone up and down the line. Does it help to know you're writing for all those people or Ben and Owen on Zoolander? Is that helpful for a writer? I had hair before I started working <laughs> on that movie. Uh, yeah, it's, um, 
It's helpful. Right. I mean, definitely, you, with, with my own scripts, or my original scripts, I usually don't think of actors. I just, or maybe I picture somebody and then it just becomes the character. Right. But it's definitely a little bit easier when you know who's gonna be playing the parts. Yeah, I mean, I would hang out with Dustin Hoffman and suddenly the rhythms of how he speaks are in my brain and I try to write, you know, incorporate the character that we came up with with the fact that it's gonna be Dustin mm -hmm. because he's gonna bring a particular energy. Same with De Niro. You know, I mean, on the first one, I'll Meet the Parents, a lot of the stuff like the circle of trust and things like that came to me out of just listening to De Niro speak and mm -hmm. the way he talks and what he talks about. And, you know, same thing with Stiller or Blythe Danner or Barbra Streisand. And had you written Along Came Polly for specific actors? I wrote Along Came Polly. I didn't write it specifically for Ben Stiller. Okay. Uh, I did not write it for him. I just wrote it. The right. only guy I actually pictured was Philip Seymour Hoffman okay. as Sandy. He was a guy I knew from, we live in the same neighborhood in New York, and I just thought he would be great in, as, as this sort of failed child star. Right. But I didn't write it, and then when I finished it, and I sent it around, I was like, oh my God, I wrote a part for Ben Stiller. I really didn't think about it during the writing. I mean, of course, he crossed my mind, but a bunch of people crossed sure. my mind. And then we did a reading of it with Ben, and I was like, it was a perfect fit. When you're outlining, how, what's the form that it takes? Do you use cards or do you just kind of like beat out scenes on a piece of paper? Or, do, or does it get as formal as like a typewritten treatment? It's, it varies. Okay. I mean, I use, I use a, you know, a big bulletin board with cards. And then, but ba basically it's really a big word document mm -hmm. that's like, you know, just has the outline and usually like in bold, I'll say this scene and then write a bunch of notes mm -hmm. about that scene, then the next scene, then the next scene. Right. And I keep trying to whittle that down to something that's coherent. Right. You know, I, then the big step is moving from word to final draft. And that's where you, you know, I have my document of, my word document to my left, and you know, I just right. keep looking at that. Has being a writer director changed your writing process uh, in terms of what it was before you directed to what it is now after you've directed? It doesn't really. It should more because like, when we shot Along Came Polly for a week in Hawaii, I was like, this is very enjoyable, and I really need <laughs> to think about where I want to set my next movie. And I thought about setting it in Europe, and it, I just didn't end up doing that. Right. Um, but usually I just approach it. Ibiza, I guess Ibiza will be the next Ibiza place. Ibiza would be great, <laughs> yeah. Right. But then I'd have to use that yeah. crazy Z, <laughs> TH thing. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, I just really, I, I know in the back of my mind I'm going to direct it, so I think about Mm -hmm. You know, I picture the scenes in my mind and like, am I gonna be able to do this? But really, when I'm writing it, I just put my screenwriter hat on okay. and just think, let's write the best screenplay I can write. Have you ever written yourself into a hole that the director in you had to get yourself out of? That's a great question. Um, Safe Men was, was on the, fir you know, the first movie, the end of Safe Men, I wrote myself into a hole at the end because we didn't have the money to do, I had this whole elaborate set piece sort of stunt thing and it just didn't work. And I should have known that, you know, in, before the night of mm -hmm. shooting. Uh, other than that, I mean, there's times where, like Along Came Polly, I wrote a sequence where a guy does a base jump off a building in downtown LA. And I didn't think at the time, like, a human being is going to do that. Right. And you talk to the guy and he's like, there's a chance he's gonna die. I mean, he's willing to take Oh my that. God, so that's this, the, was that speech given to you on the day of it was supposed to be shot? Like, um, well, here's what could go right, here's what could go wrong. Right. Yeah, I mean, in the planning of it, but really right. the day of, the guy, I mean, the guy's like doing this before he jumps, and oh I'm like, God. are you kidding me? What like, have I wrought? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you literally, yeah. I, I was, I had the worst back pain for a week before that, because right. I was like, I wrote this in my office in New York, and now there's a stunt guy literally taking a leap off a building. Um, you know, he survived. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you think about yeah. stuff like that because when you're the writer director, you like you're sure. creating this world. Is your workspace in New York, or is it mostly here now? It's in New York. Okay. Um, I mean, I I do have a place here, mm -hmm. so I write here and I have an office here. But right. the a lot of times I write in New York. And uh, what's the what's your workspace like? Like, is it do you have to get out of the house to work, or do you work at home? I try to get out of the house. Mm -hmm. So I had I just lost my office because they're turning it into a condo. But um, it was in a suite of therapists. Is it Trump? It's, it's not Trump. Okay. But uh, yeah, it was basically, it was me and a suite of shrinks. Oh. 
and well, couples well, therapists. That's, that comes in handy, I it imagine. Was, <laughs> no, I mean, literally, I'd be writing, and you'd hear screaming from a couple, you know, in couples therapy. Right. I was like, of course, oh, couples therapy. Couples therapy. <laughs> it's funny when you're right. in New York, you go, no one in LA would believe what's good because LA right. writers are, you know, and they're beautiful. They build like a deck out back, or they're <laughs> right. on the studio. Right. Here, I'm like in, you know, literally walking out to get a sandwich, and there's four people waiting to go into therapy. Right. Um, but yeah, it was just an office space, really. Bare bones. Did any of that feed into Along Came Paul, or did you get any inspiration from being around all that neurosis? I, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, that's why I like living in New York most of the time, because right. you just kind of like, there's a lot of neurosis floating around there. And do you find you're able to stay out of the, the, in, the kind of inf, inf, infectious nature of business news in terms of LA, with the way the business seeps into a, even a writer's life or a director's life? I think it's important to stay out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I try you know, try not to read right. Variety and Hollywood Reporter because the, what do I gain from it? I mean, I, sure. all I do is I'm writing and you read about a guy selling a script and it doesn't matter where you are in your career, you're like, why did he sell a script? Why didn't I sell a script? <laughs> right. You're like, well, I'm not trying to sell a script. I'm writing a script. Right. So the next call is to the agent. Yeah. Why, didn't, <laughs> why haven't we sold the script? He's like, because you, you're writing it. There is no script. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so it's, I find that stuff, I try to stay away from it. And in New York, you know, you just, you're, you're anonymous. Out you're out of it. There's not, you know, you're just kind of living your life. Right. Out here, I love it out here. I like the weather, you know, mm -hmm. it's a nice place. Um, but, you know, definitely I feel like the business seeps in and you start to think, for at least I'm susceptible to thinking sure. about, is this movie going to open? You know, who am I going to put in it? Right. Are they going to, how's the second weekend? A little yeah. bit. It no, just I've seen it. In. I've seen it happen where, you know, writers or directors call in for the grosses on Monday. And you're like, wait a minute, you know, we're supposed to be worried about the grosses. Right, Get right. On. You're supposed to be on to your next script or your next project. It, it ha it's tough. I mean, it's a business, you know, yeah. and you know that if your movies do really well, it just gives you freedom to do right. what you want to do. Do you draw much from, from your own experiences or real life, your ideas, or for your, even for accents for your scripts and, and whatnot? Yeah, that's a lot of it. I mean, a lot of it is just, you know, my life or my, it's not necessarily like things that literally happen to me in my life, but it's fears I have or mm -hmm. awkward situations that I can then put, you know, heighten it and put it into a movie. Um, we're just looking, you know, living in the world and walking down the street and right. seeing the way two people interact or, you know, like always on that cliche of at a restaurant, always listening in on what other people are right. talking about. I mean, my wife is the same way. So sometimes literally we're like sitting across from each other at dinner and just looking there at, and we're like, honey, we gotta stop. We should. <laughs> right. We're literally in their table. So you're kind of a, an observer of human nature, and, and that classic writer voyeur thing is in yeah. effect. Yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah. ever record dialogue or, or jot notes down when you hear? Or I see jot something? notes down. Okay. I jot notes down. I mean, I that the best are taxi drivers. Right. They, they are. Just, they do. They like to talk. They love mm -hmm. to talk. I mean, I have pages upon pages of what cab drivers have said to me. Mm -hmm. You know that I want always to put in scripts, and for some reason. Maybe they just think they can talk to me, or maybe everybody feels this way, but right. like, I've had them ask me questions. I mean, I sat in, in a cab the other day, and a guy was like, let me ask you a question. I eat tuna sandwiches every day. What do you think about that? <laughs> I, why would he ask me? What am I? I was like, well, there's a lot of mercury in tuna, so you may want to mix it up and... You gave a health tip. Yeah, have a little turkey. He was like, okay. Thank you. It may be that they don't, they can't talk to their wives at home and they can't wait to start yeah. talking to strangers because it's easier sometimes. I think that's yeah. it, yeah. But New York has the chattiest cab drivers in the world. They're very chatty. So you get a lot of that, you know. Yeah. It's funny, like people watch the movies I've written and definitely go, oh my God, that's that person or that's a aspect of that person. Right. You know, it's not, not I don't usually take a person I know and put them in a movie, sure. but there's traits that I take from me, from people I know, from my family, you know. Can you give us an example of something that kind of, you know, circulated in that stew and ended up on screen almost verbatim? I can't. I can't. That's cool. I'd be, I'm just I'd be outing somebody. <laughs> oh, you uh, have one, but you can't tell you us. You probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I got to keep doing this. Right. So then people stop talking to me. Have you ever uh, had something change dramatically from first draft to what ended up being in the, in the in produced version or the release version? I haven't so far. I've been fortunate. I mean, on the movies I've written and directed, the scripts have been, or the first drafts have been pretty close to what the movies have been. And then on some of the other ones where I was brought in, usually I was brought in later, okay. or I came in later, so they didn't, you know, 
Right. You might be talking to the first writer and go, Hamburg screwed up the whole thing and <laughs> changed it. But you know, usually right. I've been around towards the end and towards the shooting, so I've been lucky. I mean, I'm sure it'll happen, but... Well, maybe, hopefully not. <laughs> not going On your originals, do you do a lot of internal revising before it gets published? Do you do, have you, do, are you one of those people that kind of does 10 internal drafts before the official first draft? Yeah, always. I mean, I try to churn out the first draft as fast as I can, you know, and it's 130 or 140 pages and messy, but maybe some stuff that's gonna make it onto the screen right. is there, and then, uh, and then I just rewrite and rewrite and show it to people, you know, just a small circle of people who mm -hmm. can give me good feedback and I keep revising and, you know, then I finally, after months, I feel like it's ready to go out into the world. And how do you feel about the test screening process for comedies, do you feel like it's for that genre in particular, is it very helpful? I find it really helpful. I mean, you're not pandering to audiences, but you're making a movie for an audience to come and pay and see right. and laugh at, so I love it. I mean, it's, I would do a million test screens if, mm -hmm. if we could. I find it really helpful. Th there's a point, definitely, that you have to be aware of where it's like, okay, we can't hone everything so that we get a laugh here, a laugh there, because sometimes if people aren't laughing, they're still engaged in the movie. Sure. But they're just, you know, I think there's a tendency sometimes with studios to go, they didn't laugh. You know, right. that's, we're, in, we're in dire straits. But I find it, other than being aware that you don't just cut everything and whittle right. it down, uh, I, I love it. Cool. You know, I've, I, when I started making movies, my first thing was a video I made for my high school assembly. And that was, you know, and people laughed, and I was like, this is what I want to do. Great. And it's never really changed. So I want to discuss a scene with you that you cited as a particularly strong example of your work, and it's the classic scene where Ben Stiller's character in Meet the Parents is, is cornered by De Niro's character in a tuxedo shop and gets the famous, I'll take you down, I'll take you down to Chinatown. Yes, I'll bring you down. I'll bring you down, I'm sorry, I'll bring you down to Chinatown. Couldn't you watch the movie? Least, <laughs> Jesus, Mike. I hear good things. Okay. That phrase is now in the lexicon. Uh, it's, it, where did you come up with that? How did, what's the genesis of that? That... It's one of those things that just hit me. I mean, I, again, it was to speak to that sort of idea of the private war between Stiller and De Niro sure. and wanting to have as many scenes as possible of them, you know, basically De Niro confronting Stiller when nobody else right. knows about it. And it's De Niro suspecting that he's a pothead. De Niro suspects that, that his future son-in-law is a pothead and he, they are at the tuxedo shop getting tuxes for the wife, for the daughter's wedding and he confronts him, uh, you know, and says, I spent 19 months in a Vietnamese prison camp. You know, I, I can sense <laughs> right. when something's wrong and I'll bring you down to Chinatown. And um, basically I'd written, I think, the first version of the, of the scene. Did the first version have literally like the, the De Niro intonation of, I'll bring you down, I'll bring you down to Chinatown? It, no, the first, I, I wrote the scene and then I think had the, I, the line came into my mind as just like, it, it embodied everything that I thought the character right. should be, which was really scary but ridiculous at the right. same point. Like, it's, what does it mean to bring <laughs> someone down to Chinatown? No, it's, it's absurd because it makes it on one level it's incredibly original and absurd, and, and you hadn't heard it before. But then you manage to come up with a line that, on the flip side, you feel like has been spoken many times, and of course, it feels like an expression that's always been around, but right, right. I just never heard of before. I always try to do that in my writing. It, I don't succeed right. as much as I want to, but like to write phrases that are a little off, but could be a phrase. Right. Um, it felt like something a CA guy or, or someone in law enforcement would say. Right, and that came a lot, not the specific line, but the idea behind that line came from talking to De Niro. Okay. And he had spent a lot of time with CAA, CAA guys. Uh, <laughs> see, we're Probably in Hollywood. get better research C from yeah, CAA, CAA guys. Yeah, CAA, with CIA guys. Right. Um, yeah. So he knew the way they yeah, One spoke. agency actually does its job and the other one not so good. <laughs> that's, right, that's right, that's right, that's right. very true. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I wrote it and I gave it to Jay Roach, and I thought this is either going to be in the trailer or I'm gonna get fired, um, you know, when he comes to this. Uh, and he, Jay read the scene and liked it, and then De Niro walked in, we were in rehearsals, and he gave it to De Niro, and he said, Bob, you know, read this scene that John just wrote. So I now have to sit there while De Niro's cold reading oh, no. this scene, and um, I mean, literally my heart is racing, um, <laughs> You know, I didn't have the comfort that I have now of having a career. I was like, I could still have to find that other thing to do in right. life. Um, 
And he read it and just read it and then was like, Chinatown? <laughs> like looks up at me and I was like, and Jay was like, well, John, I mean, I mean Bob, John thought it would be, and I right. was starting to explain. He's like, no, no, it's good, it's good. <laughs> um, and then on the day, I think it might have been Bob De Niro's idea. I'm going to call him Robert De Niro. I have not done enough in my career to call Bob, him Bob. But, not, you know, not enough for Bob. Uh, but I think he had the idea to... Did he give you like a... Okay, took care of it. Yeah, me. good, good. You can stay. Um, yeah, so I think he had the idea to pull Ben Stiller into that little teeny cubicle. Right. Which I think only adds to this sort of claustrophobia oh, Yeah, the tension. setting of, of that is just so wonderfully, you know, claustrophobic yeah. and intimidating because he's towering over De Niro. Towering over him. But of course, you know, I remember when I wrote it, there was... You know, you knew they were going to be in top hats and tuxedos, so that just added to the whole thing. And, uh, you know, it was just one of those scenes that you, those kind of lines come to you and you go, okay, that's, right. you know, they so don't that happen just, enough. That just popped into your head? It popped into my head. I'd never thought about it before. Maybe, you know, living in New York and going down to Chinatown, I love right. Chinese food. <laughs> you know, I knew the movie Chinatown has a certain right. m mythic kind of, Feel to it, and you were into the, were you into the rhyming of it, just in terms of a phrase, like just how it, yeah, the, ca I, the cadence of it. Yeah, like I, I think I was talking earlier about how when I I write, I hear rhythms a lot, okay. and it's almost like when it's good, it's like music kind of. Right. And so I heard to me, it had to be, I will bring you down, baby, I will bring you down to Chinatown. Um, it had to have like right. down Chinatown. Mm -hmm. You had to have, I will bring you down, comma, baby. <laughs> and you always worry because you don't know. I'm not directing it and De Niro is De Niro. I'm not no one none of us are gonna say, you know. Right. You know, when I saw the dailies, I was like, thank he just did it much better than how I had it in my head. When you construct a line like that, like how specific are you on the page in terms of the commas or the periods or the spaces or the parentheticals? I'm very specific. Okay. I mean I write I use dot 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 all the time. Right. I use um or you know like things like that because I try to write the way people talk. And I right. think the way they talk a lot is they say, um, they say, well, you know, they pause for, because they don't know what the hell they're talking about or it's awkward or something like that. So I, I try to be very specific. And, you know, sometimes when, when I'm directing, it's almost torturous sometimes because you really want the actor to really follow that because that's the way, you know, you hear the character in, in your head. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to like, get it like that. It's not, you know, I love when people improvise and do all that sure. stuff, but like I, I try to, in certain things, be really specific about it. And on the page, it looks like that, commas and mm -hmm. dot, dot, dots and all that stuff. And you, you feel that's useful to convey what you were going for right on the page so, so everyone kind of gets it. And then have you ever like departed from that and for certain takes when either when you're directing or on the stuff you've written? where it's like they'll do it on the page um, as written and then they'll try some stuff? Yeah, always. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had the pleasure of working with people who are really good improvisers. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think if you have that basis of the character, sure. usually we'll do a few takes, you know, one way or the way it is on the page. And then if people have ideas or we just go, just improvise because it right. may do something or may loosen them up to go back to the page and have it be more realistic. So, yeah, we, I always like to do that. And for the scene uh, we're discussing, did you write in literally the, ge the geography of, of De Niro will be towering over a Ben Stiller's character and just kind of how specific were you with the physical action in the scene? I don't remember, honestly, if I, if I thought, you know, Stiller is sitting and De Niro okay. is standing. I know that I didn't write it should take place in this little teeny room because I didn't know the location. Okay. It was just like, I think I wrote probably he, he pulls Stiller into a corner of the tuck shop or maybe it was even that Stiller was changing and he opened the curtain right. and, you know, peeked in on him. Uh, which adds to vulnerability for which adds, Stiller. Yeah, exactly. Because if you can't have safety in a changing room... Right. That's, you know, there's that's your, a, a Maginot line There is you're a psychological not thing about that. that like, with the, you're in the bathroom or a changing room, you just don't expect to have your privacy yet. Yeah. And then the bath... In you know, Along Came Polly, I did the urinal. Because it's like, that's a sacred place. You don't want your boss to walk up next right. to you and start talking to you. It's just not... And were, you, were you conscious of that as you were writing, or when you were picking the location in, for either scene, are you conscious of those kind of things? Like, where, where are people most vulnerable? Okay, changing room or a bathroom? Yeah, I mean, I, those kind of things I just think from my own life. Like, mm -hmm. I am a season ticket holder at Knicks games. Right. And I always think of, like, at halftime, you go to the men's room, and there's so much pressure to is perform. It, is it the trough? It's, no, they don't have the trough. Okay. They have the urinals. Try the trough. That's a good test That's, of your self-confidence. Yeah, I avoid the trough. <laughs> right. But, you know, you're going, 
you know, everybody knows they have a certain amount of time to do their business right. and they got to get back for the third quarter and there's so much pressure. Yeah. And it's just an awkward scenario. And then sometimes you go with a buddy and he's a talker. Yeah. So he's like, hey, what, you know, I can't believe Ewing had that, uh, you know. And you're like, I right. need to focus and do what I got to do. Yeah, yeah, I want to get in and get yeah. out. <laughs> so then, you know, so then I think it's like that type of thing is in the back of my mind. Right. And then I say, you know, I'm writing the character and, oh, he's got to have his expositional scene with his boss. Well, it should, it'd be better if they're not just sitting in the office, let's put them in the urinal and, at, you know, or in the bathroom and add to that tension. Right. For the scene in Meet the Parents, did you know uh, in terms of what you needed it to do for the chronology of the story and just, you know, structurally how it was yes. going to affect the things around it? Yeah, to me, it was this escalating tension. And so I think we thought this would be a great scene for De Niro to directly confront Stiller. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's been sort of kind of under the table things going on, but this is the first time where he's like, I will bring you down, you know, right. and he starts the hand gesture, I will be watching you. And then that becomes a runner throughout the whole script, but, or the whole movie.